This geography video is going to help you revise all of your topic on population. Okay, so what is population then? Well, it's a study of people, sometimes also referred to as demography. Settlement is where the people live. So a few key terms that you need to know for this topic. We've got death rate, which is the number of people who die per year per 1,000 people. The birth rate is very similar. It's just the number of children who are born per year per 1,000 people. You need to make sure in those two definitions that you've got the per year and the per 1,000 people in your answer. The fertility rate is the average number of children that every woman has in a country. So for example, the fertility rate in the UK is going to be much lower than it is in a country like Kenya. The replacement rate is the number of children that need to be born in order to replace the present population who will die. Dense versus sparse. Okay, so a dense Dense means um, there are lots and lots of people crowded in together, so the example in this photograph is uh, Tokyo in Japan, and sparse means the area does not have very many people in it at all. People are very um, spread out, um, and the example in this photograph is the outback in Australia. So some places are more densely populated than others, and that's due to a number of reasons. First of all, it can be due to the climate. So if we have a temperate climate like we do in the UK, it means it's good for us to be able to live comfortably. We have different seasons, we have rainfall so we can grow crops, and it makes the land fertile. Um, another reason why um, some areas are more densely populated than others is because they have low-lying, flat and fertile land. If it's flat land, it's going to be much easier to build on so people can build settlements. And if it's fertile land, it's going to be much better for people to grow crops on. The example in this uh, map is Bangladesh. And additionally, a good supply of natural resources such as coal, oil um, and wood and water is going to be another reason why people want to live in a particular area. Population density is simply a measure of how close together people live and population distribution is how the people are spread over an area. This is an image of the demographic transition model and it shows how the birth rate, the death rate and the total population change across five different stages. So if we take the birth rate first of all, if you're asked to describe the birth rate, you would say in stage one, it is high and fluctuating. Fluctuating simply means that it's going up and down quite quickly. In stage two, the birth rate continues to be high. In stage three, it starts to fall. And in stage four, it is low and fluctuating before decreasing in stage five. The death rate, if we were to describe that, we would say the death rate starts off high and fluctuating in stage one, it decreases rapidly in stage two, it's slowly falling in stage three, in stage four it is low and fluctuating, and in stage five it's low and steady, with a small increase at the very end. Total population over the stages then, we've got a very low um, and steady population in stage one. In stage two, we've got a rapid, inc it's rapidly increasing. It's also rapidly increasing in stage three. In stage four, it's um, increasing a little bit less, but it's still increasing and it's quite high. And in stage five, the total population is high and starting to slowly fall away. So that's if we're describing. If we're asked to explain what is happening in each stage, we need to be able to suggest that the birth rate is high in stage one because people want a lot of children in order to support the fam farming lifestyle and to make money for their family. The death rate is high in stage one because um, people have a poor education and there is a lack of contraception, so they're not aware that they can control um, the amount of children they have through family planning. The total population is going to be so low in stage one because not many people are surviving, we've got a very high death rate. In stage two, we find that we've got a really high birth rate um, because we want the children to support on the farm, but also we want children to look after us in old age, and our healthcare and education are improving, which starts to decrease the, de the death rate. With the death rate decreasing, that means more people are going to be living, so the to total population starts to rise. In stage three, we find that the birth rate starts to decrease, and this is because we've got a reduction um, in the infant mortality rate, which means that um, the parents in um, poorer countries don't need to keep having so many children in order to replace the children that might die. And we also get the introduction of contraception, which means um, that they're going to be more aware of um, how they can control their birth rate. Life expectancy increases as the healthcare improves, which also means that the death rate is going to be falling and the pop total population is continuing to rise. 
In stage four, this is an example of where the UK is at, we've got free contraception and family planning advice, which means that we're able to control how many children that we have. The average family size is about two children, and 91% of the population have clean running water, which means our death rate is going to be very low, and therefore our total population is increasing as our life expectancy also increases. In stage five, we're finding that the total population is starting to slightly decrease. Now this is because the death rate is rising and it can be because we start to get um, obesity um, and that's because we have so much that we're able to afford um, to buy unhealthy foods. And we're finding that the birth rate is decreasing even more and that is likely to be because women um, who are in their 20s want to set up a career for themselves rather than staying at home and having children. So you can see that as we're in stage one, we're generally talking about LDCs, the least developed countries, moving through to LADC, NIC in stage three, MEDC in stages four and five. There's only one country at the moment that is in stage five position, and that is Japan. So why are the birth rates in LADCs usually much higher than in MEDCs? Well, we've mentioned a few of them already. The first reason is that um, they want the children to look after them in old age, so they tend to have a lot of children, and that can sometimes be a cultural thing. Children are needed to work on the farms in rural areas, and that is to provide money for the um, family. There's limited or no access to contraception, which means people just naturally have children and they're not able to control it. And there's also a very high infant mortality rate, so women have more children to replace the children who will die. So with, this is an example of population pyramids. You can see that we've got three examples of population pyramids here, and they are slightly different. Okay, and they, they are related to the level of development, just as the demographic transition model is. So we can see in the first one that we've got a very wide base, and we've, it's starting to um, get really narrow towards the top. So this is an example of Kenya. We can see that the narrow top means that there's very few old people, and there's a very low life expectancy. So if you look at that 80 plus bracket, there's hardly any children that are, uh, sorry, any adults who are alive at that point. There's a very wide base suggesting a large proportion of the uh, population is very young and there's a very high birth rate. And the pyramid is narrowing due to the life expectancy and people dying. As we move across to the United States, we can see it's much wider in the top and that means we've got um, an aging population, life expectancy is starting to increase. It could be because um, healthcare is improved. We've got a narrow base which suggests a smaller population of young people and a low birth rate. And the pyramid is not narrowing, um, which means that the pop working population um, is larger and it has a higher life expectancy. The dependency ratio is the number of dependents to the number of working population in a country. So if we go back to uh, the United States, we can see that the dependency ratio is quite low because we've got a low birth rate. And although we've got quite a few old people, the working age population is quite large. If we go back to Kenya, we can see that the dependency ratio is much larger because you've got lots and lots of children who are dependent on a very small working age population. There are lots of factors that affect the population, whether it increases or decreases. The first reason why it increases is because we have better medical resources and facilities, so people are able to get access to better health care. Another reason it increases is because we've got an availability of la um, a large availability of agricultural land, so we're able to grow crops in order to sustain ourselves. Decrease in population, many reasons. Um, mainly the access to contraception, that means that people are able to use things like going on the pill or condoms and they're able to stop having children so they can control how many they have. Famine means we have no food so we're going to die, that will decrease the population. Civil war, outbreaks of disease and natural disaster are all going to reduce an increase in deaths so the population overall will start to decrease. There are some problems um, with ageing population. An example in this one is Italy. So Italy has a large um, ageing population and the government are having to provide lots more healthcare for the elderly population um, through retirement homes, hospital beds and undertakers, which means that they're often not spending so, uh, money on the services for children. Um, the taxes also need to be increased um, for the working age people so that they, so the government has enough money to pay the old people pensions. And finally, money is spent on services for the elderly, like bingo halls, instead of for the young people, like nightclubs. 
Gambia has the opposite problem. They have a youthful population. They have a really high dependency ratio, like in Kenya. There's not enough working age population to support the young people. This leads to financial problems, so they don't have enough money to field all of the children, and the children are likely to get malnutrition, which is when you don't have enough nutrients and enough food, and you can die from it. Homes are often overcrowded with lots of children living in one, um, with living in one room, and sanitation tends to be very poor. Effects of an overpopulation. Well, if we imagine that the school, the Evening Grace Academy had too many children in it, there wouldn't be enough space for everybody. And it's the same with overpopulation. There's not enough land. People have no choice and live, in, live and farm in places that are no good for them, like marginal sites. So that could be steep land or land that is, um, used to be toxic waste. Rural to urban migration, so we find lots of people moving from the countryside to the um, city so that they can find work, but there's often not enough space for them, which means they create shanty towns, squatter settlements, slums and favelas. They are all exactly the same thing, they're just called different things in different places. There's also an increased demand on services like schools and hospitals and they tend to not be able to cope with the amount of people that are there. There's also a pressure on resources. Um, which increases the amount of CO2 emissions and can lead towards um, climate change. Coping with an overpopulation though, so in China they have a huge population and they were finding that they were creating lots of pollution and there wasn't enough space for everybody. So in 1980 they put in the one child policy which limited couples to having only one child. The couples with one child were given lots of benefits like better housing, childcare and longer maternity leave and if you had more than one child you were often penalised in these areas and you were fined. Um, in addition to that, compulsory sterilisation for all couples with two or more children was enforced so that meant that they st sterilised the female's eggs so that she wasn't able to reproduce and have more children. The birth rate um, has fallen from 33 per 1,000 in 1970 to 17 per 1,000 in 1996. Okay, so that means that an estimated 300 million births have been prevented since it started. Okay, that is absolutely huge. So 300 million births have been prevented, and actually 75% of China's population thinks that the policy is a really good idea. So those are the benefits. There are quite a few negatives though. China has a ratio of three boys to every one girl. So if you imagine in the future, when they get older, they're gonna find, the boys are gonna find it difficult to find a marriage partner. So then when the females are having only one child perhaps, the population is going to drastically decrease very, very quickly. The baby girls are often killed or hidden because Chinese families want a male child so that they can carry on the family name and go out to work. We get this little empress syndrome where the parents spoil their only boy um, because they are only allowed to have that one child. And we get um, the brides can often be um, hit, and um, prostitution has increased a lot in cities. Moving on to migration then, migration is simply the movement of people from one place to another. If we leave a country we are called an emigrant and if we move into a foreign country we are called an immigrant. Note the spelling for emigrant, it has one M and immigrant has two M's. Legal immigration is simply when you're moving across a border against the law of that country. And a refugee is people who have fled their homes in one country to seek a secure life somewhere else. So there's push and pull factors of migration. Push factors involve a force that pushes people out of an area, and pull factors are things that pull people into an area. So examples of push factors then, it's, generally, it's going to be a negative thing, lack of services, lack of safety, high crime rates, crop failure, drought, flooding, poverty and war. On the other hand, the pull factors are higher employment, more wealth, better services, good climate, safer and less crime, political stability, so less chance of war, more fertile land, lower risk from natural hazards. One of our case studies um, is international migration, so that's crossing the border to a different country. We've got Mexico to the USA. So the reasons why people leave Mexico is because of push factors like 1,800 people per doctor, very low paid jobs, adult literacy rate is only 55%, um, which suggests there's a poor education, and life expectancy is 72 years old, whilst 40% of the people are unemployed.
On the other hand, Mexico draw, um, USA sorry, draws people into it because they have lots of pull factors like only 400 people per doctor suggesting excellent medical facilities. They have really well paid jobs. The adult literacy rate is 99% suggesting a good education and life expectancy is 76 years old. There are lots of impacts of migration on both countries, both positive and negative. The impacts on both countries are generally going to be negative. So illegal migration costs the USA millions of dollars for border patrols and prisons. Mexican is seen as a drain on the USA economy. And the Mexican um, migrant workers keep the wages in America very low, which means the American wages aren't increasing. And they can sometimes cause problems in cities due to cultural and racial issues. On the other hand though, Mexican migrants will work for very low wages and they will do the more menial jobs that other people don't want to do. And they bring their culture with it, which has enriched a lot of the border states across the border with Mexico with food, language and music. The final negative for the USA is that they send, that the Mexicans send remittances home so that the money that they earn in the USA, they send back to Mexico and that money is not spent in the USA, which can affect the USA economy. So that's an economic negative. Impacts on Mexico then, the Mexican countryside is um, a shortage of economically active people. That's generally because all of the young people, particularly males, they leave and go to a USA to find work and they leave behind them the elderly and the young who aren't able to work. So that means that they're going to uh, not be contributing to the economy. Um, in addition to that, we've got villages like Santa Ines, um, which have lost two thirds of its inhabitants um, because they're all migrating across the USA. On the plus side though for Mexico, we've got um, six billion pounds worth of remittances coming back to Mexico. So all those people that have gone to the USA to work, they're sending back money to Mexico and it's making up some six billion dollars worth every year, which is strengthening the Mexican economy. Urbanisation then is when people move from the countryside to, to the urban area, so from rural to urban, countryside to city. Generally in MEDCs we can keep up with the urbanisation, the influx of people, but in LEDCs they have really big problems um, because they don't have the money to build the infrastructure. So we find that people end up living on the edge of cities in the periphery and in marginal sites where we've got steep hillsides that suffer from landslides. They end up using scrap materials. Um, they live in very cramped conditions, there's a lot of crime, there's not very much um, access to safe clean water, electricity or sewage. Counter urbanisation is the opposite then, so it's when we're moving from the city to the urban area, and this, uh, sorry to the rural area, so from city to countryside, urban to rural, and this generally happens in MEDCs, and it's because people want to move um, to have peace and quiet in the countryside, they want low crime rates, better schools and cheaper housing. In the city, the things pushing them out are high crime rates, overcrowding and unaffordable housing. The commute range is the distance that people will travel from their home to their place of work. And the negatives of counter-urbanisation are that the villages get really, really big and they get less of their community feel. Additional houses are built on greenfield land, which is no longer used for recreation like um, football or walking the dog. The house prices increase in the local villages so the local people can't afford to buy them anymore and because people are living in villages and not the city, they commute to the city for work and they're using their cars so it increases the amount of CO2 emissions and congestion which is going to contribute towards climate change.